librarian and Alfred University's archivist and distinguished local historian, who many of you know, I'm sure. The title of the talk is Terracotta and Alfred, an Intertwined History. So please, Laurie, take it away. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I really would prefer we were doing this in person. It's just much more engaging to have the audience. But um, I'm glad that uh, it, this has given the opportunity for people from uh, far and near uh, to participate. So I am going to do my best to wrap up by 10 of uh, 1, because we're supposed to kind of close up at 1, because uh, I want to have a chance at the end for people to offer any comments or questions. Um, I can't see the chat while I'm giving the presentation, but feel free to pop questions in the chat um, and, uh, and we'll, maybe I'll answer it down the line, you never know, um, but at the end we'll try to get what we can. So I was on sabbatical last semester and uh, terracotta was my topic uh, and the research, I'm not done, <laughs> there's so much more to learn, um, but I'm, I'm really excited to be able to share uh, and this is an overview. There is so much more that I, there's no way I can pack into, you know, about half an hour. Uh, and so I apologize if you feel like I end up talking quickly or I don't do a deep dive, deep dive into any particular aspect. Um, but my goal is to just give you a much more broad based sense of terracotta, the possibilities with it. And then my hope also is that by the end that I've brought a couple more of you into uh, being the cheerleader uh, and a, a passionate person for terracotta because we have some work to be done. Um, we, we really should save more of our terracotta. Um, it's, not an easy, it's not an easy job, but um, there's a lot to be done. Um, okay, so now I'm hoping things are going to advance. Lag. Sorry, I'm trying to advance my slide and it's not going forward. There we go. Okay, uh, so first, uh, just to acknowledge um, that we are, uh, we gather and operate at the university on traditional Seneca Nation land. Um, encourage everybody to learn more about their culture. Um, their website is sni.org or go to the wonderful museum they have in Salamanca. So terracotta bridges into so many different topics. Uh, and uh, so, you know, put a listing up here. Um, for me, primary source research, local history is my little hook into it and the grab. But uh, I, I'm thinking about maybe turning this into a, an honors course or proposing an honors course around the topic of terracotta, similar to how I do with maple syrup. Um, to use it to look into all these different disciplines because there's, it just, it, it feeds into so many areas. And that's just in my mind, another way we can grab additional people to get excited about terracotta and investigate and think about it. So first of all, what is terracotta? Um, it, it's been around for, you know, centuries. Uh, it's baked earth, uh, right? So they've pulled some material, you know, clay out of the earth, baked it somehow. Um, uh, fired at a lower ten temperature. It's not a, a high temp uh, ceramic, um, but uh, you know, for traditional like flower pots, right, in bowls and art and terracotta pipes and uh, ornamentation and decoration and art, terracotta is all over, uh, and it has been used for centuries. But um, it came in to the U.S. Uh, right. We have a wonderful time, right, industrial time. The U.S. is growing, um, uh, and it, we want to build, we want to express ourselves. Uh, and so in Chicago in 1894, the Reliance Building opened up, and the economists, you know, started describing terracotta, uh, which the Reliance Building uh, used heavily. You know, it's, it's, an, it's an innovation. It's indestructible. It's hard. But the rain's going to wash it. Uh, and if we need to, we'll scrub it like a dinner plate. Um, Susan Tunick has for a long time uh, been involved with the Friends of Terracotta Society out as a nonprofit organization based out of New York City. She's done some really wonderful writing. Um, and in a 1986 article, she just describes terracotta, you know, it's a new expressiveness to architecture in the skylands of cities. Uh, and there are so many examples uh, to be found. Um, you know, if somebody wanted to do a field trip or walk around and look up, uh, you'll see a lot of beautiful terracotta architecture that's still standing. Um, 
So what was happening? Uh, you know, terracotta was being used in other, uh, you know, certainly in Europe. Um, but in the 1870s, 1890s, uh, you know, the U.S. cities are growing and people are like, we want that here too. Um, but we're bringing it from England. So why don't we have it, you know, built and, uh, it, we, you know, we don't want to keep shipping it over the sea. So let's have our own factories. Uh, and not surprisingly, most of the factories were on the East Coast. Uh, and that's where Albert's going to come in. Uh, and so like here's a gorgeous building uh, in England, um, you know, terracotta. Uh, and so people travel, they saw these things and like, we can do this here. So why build with terracotta? Uh, you know, up to this point, of course, we're building a lot of lumber, um, but you can't build as tall. You can't be build as beautifully. Um, most of our lumber, particularly on the East Coast, right, uh, had already been cut down. Like we needed, we needed firewood to heat. We needed lumber to build our houses, um, make our furniture. So most of our land had already been stripped. Uh, we needed fields for our livestock. So um, terracotta, right, it's certainly much more fireproof than lumber. We didn't have firefighting techniques um, developed uh, to even start, stop a fire if it did start with lumber. Uh, much more easily available, right? We've got all the raw materials in the ground. It's durable, it's versatile. You can make it look like different kinds of material and different colors. You can use it to build a building. You can use it to decorate your building. So lots of great reasons that they wanted to use terracotta. Uh, and so it's all gangbusters going great. Um, and then the depression hits and that folded a number of the country uh, companies. Um, they just, they went out of business. And so you can see a little sidebar here that says, you know, 1924, there were 24 companies. Um, and then by 47, there were only seven. Um, so the industry took a big hit, not only because it was a change, um, people, right, we all change our clothing styles and our taste of what looks good. Terracotta started to go out of favor. We want to build with metal, glass, cement, things that are more modern, more contemporary for the time. Um, and then also, you know, we're starting to build taller buildings. Uh, and in this case, um, like in 1946, Alfred's company, the Southern Chair Concrete Company started, right? And so they were capitalizing on a change in taste. Um, people needed cement blocks and cement products. Um, and I don't, I'm, I don't know if my text is getting caught up at the bottom, uh, a, little, a little bit on mine is. We, st we do still build with terracotta, right? Our own McGee Pavilion, a beautiful example of terracotta uh, used in the exterior of a building for design um, by the Boston Valley Terracotta Company. All right, so let's get to the two companies in Alfred. Uh, and not everybody realizes we did have two companies. The the, we're all more familiar with the Celadon Company, which was located about where McLean Center sits and where the, the tennis courts are. Um, but there was a separate company in Alfred Station um, uh, and uh, the Alfred Clay Company. And so we're bridging about 25 years of time in Alfred's history um, between the two companies. So just to give you a little pitch in place, uh, this is the Celadon. We're looking west. Uh, and so Main Street would run you know, on the back side of this image. And uh, you can see there's lots of things going on uh, in the picture. And then in Alfred Station, this is shot from 1910. Um, and so you can see where it says Alfred Clay uh, in the lower right. And so we're looking toward Hornell, we're looking north. And so you can see the Seventh-day Baptist Church, uh, the train depot, and then the train tracks run through. Uh, Route 21 hasn't been built yet. Uh, and so, um, but just to give you a little bit of sense of when we talk about these companies, where we're talking. Lots of primary sources. So this, this presentation is full of primary sources. Uh, maps, of course, are wonderful. Um, the Sanborn Insurance Company, they did maps for insurance purposes. They wanted to know, you know, what, how buildings were built, constructed um, for insurance reasons, um, but they left us with some really amazing products. So here's the 1909 Sanborn insurance map, uh, and it's giving us great information, particularly on the, uh, the Celadon company, uh, you know, on all of their buildings and outbuildings and just how big they were. Other questions pop up like, okay, we've got two companies, were they competitors? What's the deal? 
Um, but here's uh, information out of the Alfred Sun, 1898. Uh, and just trying to say, yeah, we have two companies, but they're not competitors. They do make different types of material and, and they have different uh, people, buyers who are going to buy, you know, more high end, or are you looking for something more economical? Do you want brick? Do you want, you know, sort of what levels of decoration? Um, and they're also saying that the people that founded these companies, and I'll talk about them, um, you know, they, they weren't out just to make the money. Um, both companies were formed by groups of local businessmen who most of them were running other businesses, the bank, the insurance company, the telephone company, um, the, uh, the undertaker, um, but they got together and formed these companies. Uh, and so to make money, it says the founders uh, or to, to give employment to the, the local men and to build up the town. Um, so they had some, I think, great reasons, if that's true, uh, other than just trying to make some money. So a little side story here, um, just because, so we, we do, we're talking about terracotta and we think of the traditional tiles, but bricks, uh, and, and that's what the Alfred Station Company made a lot of are bricks. Um, but bricks are, but they're, it's not a new story to town, to Alfred. Um, here's in 1877, we have a brick kiln uh, in the village because William Burdick, who was the cheese uh, magnet in town, uh, you know, he's building this beautiful building we have on Main Street still. Uh, and so it's like, wow, where did these bricks come from? Um, you know, we didn't just haul them in on the, on the railroad, they made them here. Uh, and then I couldn't resist because it also talks about the building of the Steinheim. Um, so I had to throw that in there as well. But, uh, you know, bricks, they're clay mixed with sand or shale and some water. Um, uh, some of them were air dried, some of them were, were handmade, some were put in these forms. Um, some of them were uh, put in a kiln, but we have uh, like our beautiful brick on the university campus. Like, you know, again, 1858, 59, 60, when they built that building, where'd the brick come from um, locally? Uh, we have the beautiful green, um, we call it Green Hall today, but it was originally uh, the green block on Main Street and beautiful terracotta ornamentation in addition to being a brick building. Um, it was built after the major 1887 fire uh, that wiped out most of Main Street uh, in Alfred. But here we have, again, combination of brick and um, material from the Celadon Company. We've lost most of the top decoration on Green Hall through uh, like weather element deterioration, and they had to end up taking a lot of that, that top uh, layers down on those three top sections. Um, we, we don't want those falling on people walking on the street. Okay, brief timeline. There's so, so much more that uh, could be told about, particularly in the Celadon story. Celadon had a, a much wider reach throughout the United States than the Alfred Clay Company did, but Alfred Clay really did, um, did well for itself. Merrill, John Jake Merrill, uh, we, he should be more well known in Alfred than he is today. We do have Merrill uh, Field. Uh, we do have Bins Merrill Hall, um, both named after him. So he graduates in 1884 from the university, uh, and then he ends up going to New York and studying and teaching at the Metropolitan uh, School for Art. And then he comes back to Alfred uh, and starts an applied arts program um, because we had uh, at some art on campus, but not the applied arts program, does a modeling class, and he discovers that we have clay in our local creek beds that can be used for the kind of modeling that he was doing. So he talks to some other people. They get together in 1888, and they charter the Celadon Terracotta Company. And so we've got Merrill, a guy named Frank Vogan, um, George Babcock, and David Sherman Burdick. Uh, and so they get their first kiln, employ some men, start with a building, um, $75 building, uh, old shed that they had moved using horses for power. Um, and then Babcock, uh, the company grows, does really well. Uh, George Babcock had his own company, um, Babcock and Wilcox, uh, which is another crazy, interesting story of the you know, boilers and inventions and impact um, across the country. So he has money uh, and invests $30,000. He becomes president, uh, which is good for everybody. Uh, and then 1892, they built the office that we have down by the stoplight. And I'll talk a little bit, bit more about that in a few minutes. 
93, um, Merrill sells his, his, his stocks um, to Babcock. He has to get out of business. Um, and I've seen a reference to some financial problems. Um, it, the whole US, right? We had a financial depression uh, recession uh, in the 1890s. So Merrill sells his stock to Babcock uh, and ends up going to Albany to be the, the state tax commissioner where he has really uh, a lot of power there and he uses it to the good of Alfred um, for many reasons. But he, he, he maintains his home in Alfred, his family lives here. And then their plant, um, so in, within 10 years, the plant has grown from just their one little building um, to now it covers an acre and they can produce a railroad car a day of roofing tile. Um, they're building lots of orders, building their name. Fortunately, the plant burns down in 1899 and they rebuild it. Um, they changed their name in 1900. Uh, they want to, uh, right? It's all about marketing. It's about branding. Uh, and so if you've got advertisements and you're trying to describe who you are pretty quickly, um, they added roofing tile into their name. Um, and then 1902, um, they purchase a plant in, in Ohio. Uh, and so they become the largest roofing tile company in the U.S. There's more uh, purchases of other plants, Illinois, out of Illinois and stuff um, that's happened. Uh, and then they merged with Ludoichi Roofing in 1906, changed their name. And then unfortunately in 1909, um, another major fire wipes the plant out and they don't rebuild. Uh, and so that's kind of the end of the story in Alfred for Celadon, uh, in a way. Um, a number of people move um, from Alfred uh, and, and go to some of the other plants uh, to run the plants. Um, why not rebuild? Uh, it was hard for them to get to their shale bank um, and, and to the railroad, uh, right? The Celadon sat where McLean Center is. Their shale bank is down toward Alfred Station. Uh, the train depot is in Alfred Station. Uh, so transportation between those raw materials to the plant, finished materials from the plant to the railroad, it was really difficult and it was hampering them. Plus, at that point in 1909, Celadon had four other operating plants already, Illinois, Georgia, Ohio, and Kansas. So they're a little more better situated um, than in New York um, for access to the markets that they needed to get to. Today, uh, Ludovici does still operate today. Uh, and they're uh, the, um, in, in New Lexington, uh, and it's the, the site of their only plant, and it's the company headquarters. Okay, so again, sorry to hit you with, I'm not going to read all this text, <laughs> primary sources. Uh, and so, so just some great, you know, information that we're able to find, you know, that Merrill finds, he's the discoverer of all of this. Um, and, and, but they keep it secret, like, and, but the word's getting around to different terracotta companies that, ooh, Alfred's got this really quality clay. Um, but they did a good job. They kept it secret. They formed the company. Um, and then, but why Celadon? Why would, invite? because Celadon is a green, right? And we think of, of terracotta, particularly our roofs, they're red. So what's up with the green? Well, they did start out with the clay um, that uh, ended up with a green color, but it wasn't the type of quality material that they that they really wanted. Uh, and so the idea came along, well, let's do roofing tile. Uh, and then they, they were using a different um, clay, a, a, a different shell link. Um, but they originally were thinking, well, let's, they weren't really thinking, they weren't thinking roofing tiles. They were thinking, well, let's do decorations. Um, and so you can see, you know, they're mentioning umbrella stands and architectural. Um, so sort of like the fine decoration artistic pieces because Merrill, um, he, he loved art. Uh, and so, you know, he, when he went to the Metropolitan, um, the School of Art in New York, he studied there and he taught there, but, you know, he's studying under Lucas Baker, uh, Olin Warner, John Ward Stimson, who for their time were really well known. Uh, and so he, you know, went out of his way and then he came back to Alfred because um, he wanted Alfred to thrive. All right, gonna jump on a little bit. We're gonna go to the Alfred Clay Company. So Alfred Clay begins in 1892, actually under the name Rock Cut Clay Company. Uh, and so familiar names uh, in Alfred Reynolds, Rogers Place. Reynolds was the, he, C.D. Reynolds worked with Burdick and the Cheese. Um, actually, I haven't taken time to figure out who Rogers is. Place was a local undertaker. And then he also ran the telephone company when it was installed. Um, and then we get David Sherman Burdick involved. Uh, and they focus on bricks initially. 1896, the name gets changed, the Alfred Clay Company. Um, the Alfred Clay Company leases the, the plant from Rock Cut Clay Company, and Merrill's back in the business uh, as the president. And they also then begin to make roofing tile. 
they're employing, uh, you know, within a few years, they're growing about 20 men. Um, and you can see here's a clipping that says they're shipping a, in one week, they're going to ship 100,000 bricks. Uh, and so they weren't small, you know, on a small level, they were doing large, large orders. Um, there's a lot more research to be done in this company. There's less information available. Uh, so by 1912, they just kind of seemed to disappear. 1919, I found mention uh, referencing, you know, it's the abandoned plant. 1921, I've seen, found where the shareholders um, got together to consider selling the assets, um, but I uh, don't know what happened. Uh, and so there's, I have more, more to do this. But um, they did bring in, in 1892, this Cummins from Chicago um, to, to start the plant. And so he was an expert in the field. So they, they had a broad reach. Uh, and this is part of Alfred's story that we have so many um, people that were entrepreneurs, they were innovators. They had contacts and connections all over the place. The railroad um, allowed them to do international travel, travel everywhere, and they, they used that to their advantage. Um, so Merrill's house is down in Main Street, still stands, uh, and this is a shot of it uh, with the uh, Clay, Alfred Clay Company tiles. Um, it doesn't have the tiles on the roof anymore, but the house is still there. So what were they making? All sorts of different kinds of decorative tile. These are shots from the Celadon. Um, the two photos on the right-hand side are from the office building. So take time to look at that office building, right? It's the, it's the exterior that's the samples of their products. George Babcock uh, had over 20 patents for roofing tile designs. And um, they're just, they're the patents themselves are beautiful in the drawings. Um, Alfred Clay Company, we have two samples of their catalogs, and um, so they're pushing themselves uh, by the shortly after 1900 roofing tile, terracotta trimmings, but they were still very heavily in the brick um, business. Merrill himself got a patent on a tile press, um, which was uh, being used uh, in, the, in the plant. Uh, and then there's here's a mention as well that they were starting to manufacture flooring tile in addition to roofing and brick. I knew nothing about that part of it. Um, if they ever did, I, I don't know. Um, more to come. But they have an office in New York as well. Um, and so how did they tell people? Like, hey, here we are. Um, they did have agents that were out and about. Um, lots of information about so-and-so leaving Alfred to go wherever to talk to, to customers. But they were advertising in the clay worker and the brick builder and the architectural digest. Um, you know, and lots of information, but how impressive, like here's little old Alfred, we think. Office in New York, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Chicago. Um, the samples of the buildings that they're, they're putting their tiles on, um, lots of information. Um, and, and it just, it's really exciting to think how they built themselves up. Now, I mean, so again, just keep pushing the national level. Um, Charles Harris ran, he came out of the Midwest um, and ran Celadon for a, for a number of years. Um, but he's giving lectures, uh, you know, in, in Chicago, in Ohio. Um, they're closing large contracts in Boston, in Chicago. Uh, one of their agents is going, to, is going to Arkansas for business, um, building all over on the East Coast and in the Midwest. Uh, then in 1893, um, we have the world's, uh, the Columbia Ex Exposition in Chicago, and lots of stories around Alfred about how a replica of our office building uh, was built for the exposition. But this is the building actually that was built uh, for the exposition. So it was, it was the Celadon uh, building, Celadon Company's part of their display. So it's it is a cool building, but it's not a replica of the one we have in Alfred. So part of my research is also just trying to confirm when we have these stories that circulate around, what's the truth in them? How many of them are true? How many of them are not? You know, how things have been changed a little bit. But what happened to this building after the exposition? Uh, who knows? We don't know, but at least we have a picture of it and have an idea now. So as I got into the research, um, like happens anytime you really get into something and, and uh, you know, like who are these people? How did they, how did they have the ability to start these companies? Um, who had the capital? Why did they do it? Uh, and so these are four of the pretty main players. Marilyn Burdick 
They started both. Well, they were instrumental in both companies. Uh, you know, Merrill and Burdick were the um, first of the Celadon between the idea, the first president, and they brought Babcock in. Uh, Charles Harris ran it for a long time. His brother came into it. Um, so there's 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 so many there's people behind all of these stories, uh, and and they're fascinating. Uh, Sherm Burdick, uh, his house. I showed you Merrill's house. Sherm Burdick's house is familiar to most of this as well in Alfred. Um, for some, we know it as the ZBT fraternity house. Um, for others, uh, today it's the Cohen Gallery and the Cohen Center. Um, and then uh, William Burdick, his brother, uh, is the house, the Fasano House. Um, and so. These families and these men had such an impact. Um, and how are they tied together? Not surprisingly in Alfred, the Seventh-day Baptist Church. Um, the Harrises weren't uh, Seventh-day Baptists, but pretty much every other person <laughs> that I found connected with it is a member of the Seventh-day Baptist Church. And there's interfamily relationships and marriages. Uh, and so just fun stuff to explore. Their impact on Alfred cannot be understated uh, on the economy, on employing. Um, these are um, shots on the left are the Celadon employees at one point, and on the right are the Alfred Clay Company employees. Um, but uh, conditions, road conditions, I mean, they're destroying the road, um, particularly from Celadon, uh, you know, horse and wagon drawn down to the shale bank back up in the mud and the snow. Um, 1895, Alfred had the first macadamized road in the county um, because they needed the road to be better to support these massive weights um, and, and transportation. Um, and then once Alfred got a macadamized great road, uh, bicycles were all the rage and everybody was coming to Alfred to ride their bicycles. <laughs> um, College of Ceramics, you know, I'm gonna take a little, just talk about the impact. Um, again, nationally, right? building, 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 building. Um, not only the physical buildings, but the infrastructure. National Brick Manufacturers Association uh, is deploring. We don't have any colleges in the US that are teaching ceramics and we need workers that are trained in ceramics for our buildings, for our projects. Um, and so uh, the industrial ceramics, right? They were paving a lot of roads and sidewalks with bricks in addition to the buildings using the tiles for drain, decoration, roofing. Um, so 1898, the university had opened a department of industrial mechanics. Um, Babcock was heavily involved in that. And so we had some facilities on campus. Um, 1899, uh, Booth Collel Davis was our president. Uh, he was fighting to keep the university um, alive. Our enrollment was suffering. Um, our budget was not good. Um, hey, we do have two companies in Alfred. Um, Merrill is the tax commissioner in Albany, has lots of power. So Davis and Merrill uh, encouraged the university to get into uh, industrial education and to um, eventually in 1900 get the School of Clay working here. Um, and then there's a picture of Bins Hall uh, named after Charles Bins, which was the first building for the school. Uh, of course, it had a terracotta roof and, and made with local brick. Uh, equipment, like whole other avenues somebody could think about and explore. What kind of equipment, machines did they have? Who invented it? Um, and so, uh, yeah, mills, grinders, presses, kilns, boilers, uh, you know, and we need somebody to build those, to maintain them, to run them, um, to repair them. We needed artists and modelers, right, to do the handwork, uh, to do this beautiful work. Uh, and so how did they do uh, it? How are they trained? Um, but our work from Alfred is examples are all over the country. Uh, so William Burke Kenyon, if you're walking, so those of you in Alfred are familiar with where Nana's restaurant uh, was, the house past it was Burke Kenyon's, I think it's a one house. Um, but there are little terracotta figurine heads uh, like in the, the side porch um, because Kenyon made those, brought them back to the company. To, um, and here's Kenyon uh, standing up to a massive piece uh, that he's working on. And there's this, that's the piece uh, on a building in Scranton, Pennsylvania. So, um, you know, just give you a little bit of size of him <laughs> next to it and then the size of this building. Uh, so we've got these two businesses in town, right? And like every other place, when we talk about any factory, any industry, there's all the supporting businesses um, that all needs to come together. Uh, and so the terracotta company, you know, is 
need some straw. So reaching out to the farmers because that's how they packed their tiles to ship them. The railroad, uh, Rogers Machine Shop um, was uh, another, is another fascinating story of Alfred history and innovation. Um, they built some of the, the machines, helped prepare them. Um, Western Union Telegraph Office at one point was uh, located at Celadon because they were a uh, heavy user of it. Um, but even the shoot, like the, the restaurants, the, um, the, the workers needed shoes, they needed like clothes, uh, all of this tied together. But the, the impact from having the factories in town um, to the local economy was, was um, essential, but as was the railroad. Um, so here's the train station down on Alfred Station, uh, or the depot, um, which we still had the building, but we don't. Of course, it has a terracotta roof. Uh, many of the Erie depots um, had terracotta roofs. Uh, the one in Wellsville, yay, I saw it just sold. So hopefully, or it's hopefully selling. <laughs> so maybe it's going to be saved. And um, the one in Nichols, Appalachian, they both have uh, terracotta roofs. Um, but the railroad, right, they delivered tiles and bricks to customers, the finished products. They brought supplies to the factories. Um, like after the factory uh, burned, they wanted to rebuild. You know, they says that they expect 20 carloads of lumber just this week because they're trying to rebuild their buildings. Um, the executives, uh, so much transportation back and forth. Oh, Merrill came home from Albany for the weekend. Harris just went to Chicago. Clark has gone here. They used the railroad, um, and um, so the railroad, it was essential to the whole operation. They were trying to get desperately Erie to build uh, a switch from Alfred Station into the village um, that would have made a huge difference, wasn't successful. Shale banks, um, of course, where they get the raw materials from, uh, out of a shale, well, Seligan used a shale bank down uh, Alfred Station on 244, and then, um, Alfred Clay used one uh, on the other side uh, from 21. But Teamsters, right? Employment, the horses, uh, and they're hauling three ton, five ton, lots of weight um, out of these shell banks up and down the roads. Um, very physical work. Uh, so here's a shot of the shale bank. Uh, we're pretty sure this is the shale bank location um, down in Alfred Station. Um, so there's the depot again, we're looking uh, We'll be looking, Alfred's, Alf, the village of Alfred would be sort of on the other side of that hill. Um, and so you can see the Alfred Clay Company. Um, and so they, good for them, they were right along the railroad. Um, the center uh, brick building is uh, the cold storage building for the cheese factory, um, in addition to the depot. Um, another story we hear around town are that a lot of our roofs in Alfred were built with seconds or they were built for free. Um, so I finally did at least find a reference to Celadon saying they have a bunch of second grade tile that they need to sell quickly um, in 1904. And this is a house up on Reynolds Street, which does still have the terracotta roof um, built in uh, 1904. So maybe it bought some of those seconds, I'm not sure. Okay, so what happened? Where do these companies go? Um, as again, I mentioned in 1909, uh, Celadon had a major fire. Um, and so here's a photo of it right after the fire. Um, and there's still lots of pieces there, the chimneys and the kilns. Um, Alfred Clay Company, we know that by the early 1950s, uh, I think it really was just left to disrepair and kind of fall in. Um, and then um, and sometime in the early 50s, I haven't nailed it down yet, they did drop uh, the chimney um, and just piles of rubble and brick. And so more research to be done on that one. The university ended up acquiring the site of the, the uh, what was the Celadon factory. So this is a photo from 1932. Um, we're looking south. And so uh, sort of the center building with the road looping around it, that's Bartlett Hall. Um, and so we had had a night um, in, Earlier, around 1900, the university had uh, our athletic field that we know of as Merrill. Um, and so you see way at the bottom, but it's like, wow, it's a bit remote. Um, and so it was quite a distance from the actual campus. And so in 1920, the university purchased the, um, the, the land from Celadon and, um, and, and then turned that into more athletic fields. We had our track there um, and more, um, more facilities. And today, um, McLean Center and the tennis courts are in that area. The office building, just to highlight that for a minute, uh, was built in 1892. Um, and so 
there's a great story I'm not getting into it right now about John Enos. Uh, fortunately, luckily, <laughs> wonderfully finding some old glass plate negatives um, that gave us some images we didn't have before. Um, and like, so oh, amazing that we have a photo of the office building um, being constructed. And so it's entirely from brick and terracotta made from Celadon. Um, and then um, great shots of it. And it is listed on the National Register of Historic Places as an individual building. So um, I really don't know what happened with the office building between the fire and the university acquiring it, 1909 to 1920. It might have just sat there and not much of anything. But from 20 to 69, it was owned by the university, but then it was used for a variety of different purposes. The um, police department was in there at one point. The Alfred Rodden Gun Club used it as an office building. Irma Hewitt had her jewelry business there. Uh, and then in 1969, when the university wanted to, it was going to build McLean Center, they um, it sold the, the, the building like for a dollar to the Alfred Historical Society, which raised money, uh, put it up, uh, you know, got it off the site. And then in 1974, they set it on the new foundation where it sits today. Um, and then it was transferred um, back or on that sort of two back to, but transferred to the state. So today the office building by the stoplight is actually owned um, by uh, the state through SUNY. 1991, um, the two local historical societies and the Friends of Terracotta organization got a grant. They hired Terry Palmer to do a survey of all the terracotta roofs in Alfred. So Terry, photographed and documented 102 structures in Alfred in 1991 that had Alfred roofs. Um, this is a wonderful example of one down on Main Street. So if you ever look at the roof, it says JNN20 for John Nelson Norwood, uh, class of 20, who was a student, became one of our presidents. Um, lots of terracotta related projects, uh, certainly. So terracotta is not a dead thing uh, just because our factories went away. The University AU Research Foundation uh, got into um, what they call the Bakeware Project, uh, which is now what we know as Tufty Ceramics. Um, of course, the College of Ceramics um, has research for industry, starting with Charles Binns um, through the CAT Center today. Um, they revived what was called the Terracotta Picnic in the 1990s. Um, the Terracotta Company used to have these wonderful summer picnics, um, like 300, you know, for their employees and their families. And so in the 1990s, it was a great village event um, to revive the Terracotta Company picnic. Um, there was a great project in 1992 with some Alfred Allman students where they were able to create their own little terracotta, decorate, fire, have it, their own terracotta tile. Um, can't say enough about Wally Higgins and Norma Higgins and the entire Higgins family. Um, they definitely did a lot with terracotta uh, through their uh, New Frontiers and Norwell companies. Um, we've got Boston Valley Terracotta today. We've got Replacement Tile Solution. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a lot still going on with terracotta. Great material in our archives. We continue to build them. Um, these are, this is a shot of uh, two pieces that were dug up when we built the annex um, to McLean fairly recently. And so I have those in the collection. Um, so just trying to continually, as much as we can, build and discover and research uh, these companies. Uh, there's got to be information out in personal family collections that, uh, you know, maybe over time they'll start to surface and we can learn more and more because uh, there's so much to try to learn. So what's happening today? I'm going to try to wrap up, um, right? We have so much history, so much heritage, something to be proud of, something we can capitalize on. How do we keep this story alive? Um, keeping fingers crossed, we've got uh, several possible irons in the fire to, to try to get some money to the office, definitely needs um, some renovation work. It's a keystone piece, um, nothing like it anywhere, right? And we, we need to be able to save that office building. I'm working on developing a, a website so we can get a lot of this information available. Uh, we want it to be shared. We're trying to update that roof survey, um, continuing research on the companies. Like I'm just trying to figure out like who worked there. So um, like capturing names, doing a Google map um, so we can pinpoint like with photos, a little information on the different terracotta um, things. So people can do their own virtual tour or do a walking tour. Um, hopefully we'll get an historic marker for the office. Um, the Alpha 21st Century group uh, is thinking, can we have terracotta be a theme for the village as a way to brand and market the village? Um, can we get it more into the, the curriculums, right? I mean, art, engineering, business, history, and, and lots of levels. Um, we could get our students involved. Um, so there's just so much. Um, this summer, uh, we're planning an educational workshop for uh, roof owners. 
uh, like it's a, it's a challenge for people who own a structure or house right now with a terracotta roof um, to as much as we all want to save them, it's it's not cheap. Um, and and so hard choices are being made of, of we're, we're starting to lose roofs. Um, and that just collectively, you know, hits the entire story of Alfred, not the entire story, but a big piece of Alfred's story, right? Is the, are the aesthetics, are the visuals together, the terracotta, like, and how can we start reusing stockpiles of terracotta for decorations, um, for embellishments to keep keep the idea alive and, and celebrate it. So uh, we just, we there's lots of ideas. We need champions, um, action support. Uh, and so some of that is definitely ramping up today um, and I'm excited about it. Okay, so, okay, so I've got a couple minutes left. Um, so I'm gonna stop talking. Um, time for questions and comments. This is another great shot of Alfred with the terracotta factory uh, in the center. Um, in our in the great village. So, uh, okay, I'm going to stop sharing and then jump into time for questions and comments. And then I can see everybody. Um, thank you, Laurie. Uh, there's one question from Gary in the chat. <laughs> it, only seven terracotta companies remained by 1947. How many today? Mm, I don't have an answer to that at the moment, to tell you the truth. Um, not that many. Celadon is one. Uh, if anybody else is on and knows a better answer to that, you can you can help. Um, Kevin Jacobs uh, says that he thinks around 2011 or 2012, the Fosdick Nelson did a great show where all work was reused terracotta. I'm sure Sharon McConnell has the documentation, and Sean Murray, our kiln technician, was one of the artists for those interested. Great. Great, thanks, Kevin. So I like all these bits and pieces are great. And I, that's what I wanna to try to keep building into our, our archives is this kind of documentation and information because together it really helps fill out the story and keeps the story. Um, Toby okay. Duncan says, uh, Ludovici uh, MCA in the US that I know of still making play. Several of those making cement tiles. But okay. I guess Toby, what's what's MCA, Toby? Uh, MCA is just another manufacturer of clay tile in the U.S. Um, okay. They're based in um, California, near okay. LA. Okay. All right. Thanks, Toby. You bet. Becky. Becky. Has a yeah. Um, first of all, thanks for clearing up the reason that it was called terracotta celadon, um, but do we have any examples of that early work? Well, the description of the office building in one of those advertisements says that it was built with those, the green glazed celadon tile. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, yeah, but, but again, I, I, I'm not an expert in ceramics. Uh, and so I don't know that it was the, you know, they didn't use it for roofing tile, right? focused on the more ornamental and, and Celadon did actually make bricks as well. So, um, but it looks like they didn't do much with it for very long before they uh, switched to the, the red, but I, I am not a, an expert in ceramics. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, Sherman is, is saying something. Um, is it a response to Laurie's question, Sherman? Uh, yeah, Boston Valley Terracotta uh, is run by um, Alfred alums, uh, and so they do make, they use some. So I guess the question, so Boston Valley, I don't know if they make roofing tiles, and so, right, some, which companies make the roofing tiles? Okay, John's saying no, and which ones are making terracotta as a, uh, a more structural or decorative, uh, you know, and so those are different kinds of companies. So I think Toby's answer was that Ludovici and MCA are, are making um, high, the more of the roofing tiles. Okay, Doug Clark um, is asking, what is the source of the article which says that Will R. Clark had the idea of the making tile? Oh boy, hold on, uh, Doug, I'll have to get that to you. I can't remember if- Yeah, you can get back to me, that's fine. Yeah, let me just write myself a note, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
I hadn't seen that one before. Yeah, the, you know, there's so many articles. Well, I'm finding more information. Um, and like I just did a search on Fulton history uh, because I'm, I'm sometimes I'm going through all of the Alfred Sons. I'm reading for like almost 30 years of the Alfred Son and pulling every single mention I can get on Terracotta and uh, both companies. But sometimes I think because they were the Alfred newspaper and everybody you know knew what was happening in Alfred, they were more brief. But sometimes like the Bolivar Breeze or the Belfast paper or Friendship or Cuba Patriot would have a longer article, a more, you know, because they're a different audience. And so, um, yeah, okay. Um, Sandra has a question. Are the green tiles and bricks as sturdy uh, the red terracotta, as the red terracotta ones um, that they, they did was, um, um, was the restoration of many buildings at Columbia University. Um, okay, that's a question for somebody other than me to answer, like John, who wants to talk about point my finger. They're just as sturdy. Just as sturdy. They, they, they're the same clay, they just have a different, uh, a, a different metal cation in there to give it a different color. Okay. Um, Tim Cox, I, I think it's Tim, is saying, my house in Alfred Station, very near the karate studio, was built in 1960. The lot, which was, of course, covered, prepared a few years before the house's reconstruction, is a flat space composed of hard fill that includes a lot of cement, macadam, brick, and ceramic tile beneath just a few inches of sod. I wonder whether the hard fill is in part rubble from the abandoned post-fire Selenden Company. Would you know, Laurie? Well, yeah, it, it certainly could be. Um, at one point, I did find a reference that, so the road had been macadamized, but of course it was being torn up, um, that some sections they did use, they, they were trying crushed tiles, you know, like from the factories, uh, they were putting those on the roads to see if that would help. Um, but Tim, it's very possible, certainly uh, we, we tend to like uh, move dirt from one place to the other and that composition. Um, I can remember, so Cliff Jabril, many of you knew Coach Jabril, telling me that when he came in the 50s, the site of the terracotta plant was the town dump. Uh, and he said it like burned 24 seven. I, uh, that just sticks in my mind. I don't have any evidence of that um, because I know when they did build the annex on the McLean Center, they found a lot of you know samples of broken glass and broken dishes. And um, yeah, so archaeologically excavation time, absolutely. So there was a water main break uh, right in front of McLean Center a week or two ago. Um, and uh, Jim Ninos told me that, you know, as the crew is digging down through, it was wonderful because they, because that water main break happened right basically in front of where the office building sat. Um, he said we can, they could see very distinctly the layers of the dirt, the macadam, um, a layer of uh, a tile, um, a terracotta like a paving tile and then new gravel and new, and so it's just definitely an archeological dig. Um, Vicky says that there's an image of an 1899 document from Selendon on the uh, Ludovici website. And Becky, I think we're getting into boasting here, Becky. She believes that <laughs> her home, 72 South Main Street, um, belonged to George Babcock. And there's a photo of the house from 1900 that has the name Babcock on the back. Of course, we'll need evidence of that, but I believe her. I was um, thinking George Babcock lived. Um, it's a White House on the left. John Enos owns it. It's an apartment building. It's where he found the glass plate negatives. I thought so. See, they, all of this is stuff. I just I I don't have haven't had time to turn on all my details. I want to. Uh, Laurie, I have a question. Um, I noted when they just took South Hall down that the, they were careful to preserve the terracotta tiles, right? Are, are the terracotta tiles valuable? Uh, you know, I guess it depends on who you ask. Um, there are stockpiles of terracotta tiles all over Alfred and different properties. Um, they're not easy to reuse, like necessarily for a whole roof because they're made very specifically for that particular roof, uh, you know, and there's different uh, ridge pieces and tiles and shapes and corners and edge pieces. Um, and so it's much easier to reuse them on smaller, you know, sort of buildings rather than 
uh, an entire roof. Not always easy to use to just like fix it as a repair. So, so yeah, I mean, yeah there's, yeah, there's value, right? We don't want to lose them, but I really, I want somebody to come up with an idea like what, you know, can we, I don't know, does somebody want to start painting little pictures and, and selling individual tiles, you know, that we can hang on our walls. Um, but Toby, Toby says he can speak to this. Yes, go ahead, Toby, please. Um, just from a financial value um, to a homeowner who has a possession of uh, salvage tile, there's not a lot of value to it. Um, as a homeowner who has a tile roof and needs them, there is definitely a value. Um, there is a salvage industry that exists. There's a salvage yard in uh, Chicago. There's one in Delaware, uh, outside of Wilmington. There's one in Amarillo, Texas. Uh, there's a couple others. There's one in Dallas, Texas. There's a few around the, the country. Uh, and, and they deal with old historic tile that's been removed from roofs. Um, you know, they generally deal in a handful of tiles at a time um, for small uh, repairs on roofs. Um, occasionally, I've seen entire additions of houses made using this tile. Uh, the issue come is that it's very difficult to find the trim tile. So edges, corners, uh, the ridges, hips, all of those, those are very difficult to find. Those, those have been purchased many, many years ago. Um, what's left now is a lot of the field tile. Um, there are, these salvage yards will buy the tile from you, but they're paying almost nothing for it. It costs as much to ship it as they're paying for it. So there's very little value if you're wanting to rip one off and sell it. Um, but like I said, if you're, if you have one and, uh, you, know, you need, you need tiles for it, um, you know, salvage yards will charge as much as it costs to get brand new tile. 100 year old tile. Uh, Sandra Singer is asking, uh, she says, our barn has a terracotta clay roof. Why did people bother to put such tiles on barns? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have an exact answer to that. I mean, if people could get them more local, you know, locally, more, more cheap, and like, you know, they put on their all sorts of outbuildings and sheds and barns. Um, and so, yeah, I don't have an exact answer. It's a great question, Sandra. Um, uh, but it must have been, you know, either economical, um, whether they wanted it for aesthetics as well. Um, Becky. Becky, yeah. The folklore of the 19, by the 1950s at least, was saying that um, it was a cheap local resource by using seconds. And so um, back back 50 years before the folklore I have, um, people, it was reputed that people went to the factory, picked up the tiles they needed and brought them home themselves <clears throat> and installed them. And you're right, Lori, there are all sorts of outbuildings that are um, covered. And um, the property next door to us, 74 South Main, um, has or had um, at least until the 1990s just rows and rows of terracotta tiles that Dr. Watson had planned on using to repair his um, uh, apiary. So, um, yeah. um, question from Otto Muller: When did they shift from the Alfred clay to the shale? Again, I'm, I don't have the background in ceramics uh, as much as I should ask or I could, Otto, because um, the shale they would grind up or, you know, right, and make it into a, so I just, I'm not a, the technical part of it isn't, isn't my forte, I'm sorry. Okay. Am, I unmuted? Just, we, Am I unmuted? This Keith, is key. Yes. yes. We okay, can I can't. Uh, it, it says I was muted. Um, Terry Palmer told me back when he was doing the study that uh, locals could get the seconds for a dollar a wagon load. And we see them on barns scattered around us, um, mostly falling in because they're so darn heavy. But yeah. it was an, ec an economical roofing material for them rather than getting the shakes, which was the... Uh, you know, the common local 
roofing material. So that was Terry's yeah. explanation back when he did that study. Yeah. I do question the dollar. So Toby just put in that the tiles were selling for $6 per 100 square foot in 1902. Seconds would have been about $1 to $2. Because um, the one article that I found in 1904 where they said they had seconds, they had a price in there. Uh, it wasn't um, a dollar, it wasn't quite a dollar wagon load, but but yeah, so. I, I remember that figure and that's from yeah. 20 or 30 oh, yeah. years ago. So. Exactly, yeah. Uh, you know, in Terraca, you know, a lot of people would, they wreck, they change their houses, you know, and so it started, it could have started out in, you know, a Gothic or, you know, and then they switch it to a Victorian style and, uh, but they would add, you know, the roofs, Terracotta roofs went on houses, not always at just at initial construction either. Um, but it's so wonderful to see, you know, be looking through photos like, oh, yep, that had a Terracotta, yep, that had a Terracotta roof. And it's only recently in my head, you know, that the Alfred Clay Company made roofing tiles. And, and so like the house on um, the Kelly's house at the top of Glen Street, that was owned by Charles Stillman, who was uh, involved, he was one of the agents of the Alfred Clay Company. So that's got an Alfred Clay Company roof on it, as did the Merrill House, which is um, the race house as we know it today, uh, had the roof tiles as well, or Alfred Clay. Um, the Roycroft, and he go, but he goes to East Aurora to the Roycroft. The Roycroft has three or four buildings that have Alfred Clay uh, tile roofs um, and not, not Celadon. Um, also, while I'm talking about another thing that Terry told me um, was that tiles such as the one on uh, the house, the barn with the with the date on it. Yeah. Yep. That those darker tiles were over fired. Oh. And that gave them that darker uh, color, and that's that was Terry's explanation for yeah uh, for that. So they were made use of that way. Yeah. See, and that roof in particular brings a question to my mind because you know it's got uh, you know his graduation year, nineteen twenty, uh, and so were those tiles left over in Alfred that he then put them on top of the building, or did he like they liked them so much that he contracted with Ludovici Celadon and had the tiles brought in? Uh, mm -hmm you know, in addition to the cool clock that's on that garage. Yeah. Um, Laurie, it's, um, we're about 10 minutes past time. Uh, <laughs> there's intense interest in the topic. Um, so I want to wrap it up. Uh, I want to thank Laurie for a wonderful talk. The only question remaining, when's the book coming out? You know, uh, <laughs> I hope she's working on. Um, but I'm not going to close the Zoom. If any of you, uh, you know, if you've got more questions, more comments, you just want to carry on, um, uh, talking, including suggestions, because Laurie at the end there was asking for, you know, any kind of suggestions for how we might, um, the university or the community, the village might actually use the terracotta history in, a, in any sort of, um, you know, commercial way or, or publicity way or anything. So um, thank you again, Laurie. And uh, if you've got more questions or suggestions or comments, stick around. Thanks, Emrys. Laurie, were you talking about the uh the garage at 105 North Main with the clock? Yeah. Okay. No, I see you said you have some letters. Yeah. Um, we have letters that were written by A.B. Kenyon because he worked with John Norwood building the garage. Um, I don't think there's anything about the clock, but yeah, that's, yeah, it was 1920 was, I believe the year they built the garage um, and then hit, JN is for John Norwood's initials there on the right. other side, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I'll be happy to share those with you. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, because another thing I want, you know, want to build a spreadsheet of all the individual properties. And then just as we keep getting, you know, bits and pieces of information of when did a roof go on? When did a roof go off? Right. You know, have our sources to just um, help build information on individual properties as well. All right. I'll get those to you so you can scan them. Okay, thanks. Well, Lori, thank you. That was a fascinating thing. You have a, a unbelievable knowledge of the houses of Alfred. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and I only scratch the surface. There's other people that know a lot more than I do, but um, I think I, I want to put you. Fun. I want to put you and Becky into a competition. Right. Oh, Becky would win. I guaranteed Becky would win. <laughs>
my idea is that we'd, we'd, just, we'd take you blindfold around the village and stand you in front of the house and then start describing little features of the house and see who can guess the, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who, who lived there in 1887, right? Yeah, right. Yep. No, you well, I, I just want to add, I really don't know very much, um, but I'm really, really pleased that Laurie is doing such an amazing job to track down all aspects of Alfred's history. Um, and it's just, it's astounding. So thank you, Lori. Yeah, well, it, it's my life, my passion. I love it. Live, breathe and sleep it some days. So my husband will tell you. Um, so Sherman, yeah, you know, I, you, I, I think I completely misspoke when I said the 20 in that garage was uh, Norwood's graduation year. Um, I think he graduated in like 05 or 06, now that I think about it. He's an interesting story. He came from England, yeah. The thing that struck in my, stuck in my mind, Laurie, is when you said that you've read 30 years of Alfred's sons. Um, Almost. I have a few more years yet to go, but um, uh, I'm branching out into the papers. That's impressive. Uh, you know. <laughs> Super interesting, right? Because all of this ties together. Uh, and so, you know, between the fires, you know, they're pushing for people to have insurance uh, and we need a fire company and we need a water system, right? Uh, and so that we can like, but all of these industries and entrepreneurs, you know, are working together yeah. uh, to say, you know, we need to build up our town. We need to protect our town. We need, you know, um, and, uh, but it's, it's fascinating. It really is. Does it work? <clears throat> does, yeah, it works, right? Yeah, it does. Uh, Hi, Sue. Hi. Um, I wanted to say our house had a tile roof on it for a short oh. while. You could see it was making the roof, the ridge sag. So yeah. I don't think it lasted long. But regarding the use on barns, all this I've not thought about this in any depth at all. But I think that using it on a barn would be a way of safeguarding your investment under that roof. If you could get those tiles that cheaply and that locally, it, it would probably make some overall economic sense to do that right oh absolutely so the thing i'm sort of paying attention to when i do with through the alfred sons are the competitors because there were um other businesses in town who were you know tin roofs and um shingles and and so you know lots of references to people using other materials on their roof as well uh and so like yeah, how did you decide you know like which roof you're going to put on and whose company you were going to support yeah, and if your roof is going to sag, ours has a tin roof now, so it's had that for over a century. Yeah. So the, 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 there's one picture I have, if you're interested, showing the tile roof. But it oh, didn't, okay. I don't remember the date, but it didn't last very long. <laughs> yeah, was it when the Vincents owned the house? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no, that would be great. And again, wondering like which style. And so Toby's been uh, wonderful. Um, for those of you, uh, Toby's our go-to guy <laughs> out of Texas. Uh, that's his, his, his lives and breathes as well, uh, is restoring um, historic celadon roofs um, and also doing a really intensive research uh, and writing on the history of celadon. So he and I are trying to, you know, dovetail our work um, but Toby can tell it, you know, when I shoot a, a photo, I'll say, hey, is this some um, celadon? If so, which style tile? And then, uh, or, or is it, you know, could it be an Alfred Clay Company um, tile? So, yeah. Lori, More work. Um, I'm going to have to go. I can leave the okay. Zoom open, but I'm going to have to go and work. Um, okay. So, but I, I'm, I'm just going to leave the Zoom open. I'll close it when people have stopped talking to you. All right. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay, thanks again. That was wonderful. Well done, Lori. I'm checking out too. Okay, yeah, that's Bye. fine. I just wanted to make sure I didn't, you know, want to cut people short and okay, flew through. So thank you everybody for coming. If there's no other, please, uh, so nian at alfred.edu is my email um, or, you know, just track me down in the library somewhere. Uh, further questions, more information, if you have something to help build our archive collection, it would be great. Thank you, Lori. You're welcome. Bye, Marianne.